morning, everyone. So <clears throat> yesterday, uh, we tried to explain that uh, um, if we phrase the information paradox from the point of view of an observer sitting at infinity, uh, the question is how, how can a thermal state, uh, which is predicted by Hawking, be uh, converted to a pure state by small corrections? And we argue that this, uh, this is actually natural from the point of view of statistical mechanics and can be achieved with exponentially small corrections. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we argue that what is more difficult is to reconcile this scenario with uh, the smoothness of the horizon. And the reason uh, for the difficulty is that uh, in order for the horizon to be smooth, we need to have very specific entanglement of the quantum fields uh, between the interior and the exterior, uh, which was actually inconsistent with a previous statement that uh, the radiation is, is, uh, is unitary. And today, uh, what we'll try to do is to uh, reformulate these questions uh, into questions in, uh, within the framework of the ADSFT correspondence, and we'll try to address them using the boundary conformal field theory. So before I go on, are there any questions uh, about this? OK. So uh, I suppose that uh, you're, uh, you have some basic familiarity with uh, the ADSFT correspondence. So, um, we will say, take the conformal field theory uh, to be defined on, uh, on, uh, M on a sphere cross time. So we take a CFT uh, on S D minus 1 cross time. Uh, and uh, some of the CFTs are supposed to be holographically dual to string theory on uh, ADS uh, D plus 1 times some internal manifold. The internal manifold will not play any role in what I'm going to say from now on, so I will ignore it. Uh, and uh, we will focus on the ADS part. And uh, the idea is that uh, everything that happens in the bulk is holographically encoded on the boundary. Now, uh, before I go on, I want to, make a, to remind you of something basic, which is that in, uh, in ADS, uh, in particular in the backgrounds of this form, we can classify black holes into uh, small black holes, those whose uh, radius is smaller, much smaller than the ADS scale, and uh, large black holes. Uh, where the radius is larger than the, of the order of the ADS scale, let's say, and larger. And uh, small black holes in ADS uh, can evaporate, and uh, we can uh, consider the information paradox for evaporating black holes in ADS, uh, while large black holes in ADS do not evaporate, uh, in particular, uh, so they emit Hawking radiation, but the Hawking radiation uh, gets reflected by the potential barrier of ADS, and they, the, the black hole reaches an equilibrium with Hawking radiation. So uh, large black holes do not evaporate, but uh, as we will explain later, uh, we can phrase uh, similar paradoxes for large black holes. And the point is that uh, small black holes in ADS are not very well understood from the point of view of the CFT, while uh, large black holes are supposed to be uh, dual to uh, thermal states in the conformal field theory. And in particular, at the level of microstates, the black hole microstates of a large black hole in ADS are supposed to be dual to the quark gluon plasma microstates of the deconfined uh, theory at high temperatures. And uh, in particular, this correspondence is very successful in explaining the entropy of black holes. Because we think of the black hole entropy as uh, being counted by the different microstates of the quark gluon plasma. So, uh, now, if we ask the question about uh, the information paradox uh, in, a, in the most basic formulation, in particular whether uh, if black hole evaporation is unitary, ADCFT uh, predicts that uh, the evaporation is manifestly unitary because the boundary conformal field theory is, is unitary. So you can imagine uh, creating a, a black hole in ADS by the collision of two particles that you create uh, on the CFT by some uh, oper local operators, which will eventually, if, if the black hole is small enough, it will eventually evaporate. And into, uh, into particles, and this process can be described within uh, ADS. So uh, it's, and it is equivalent to some process in the conformal field theory, so it is manifestly unitary, and then there's no longer any discussion about information loss. Now, so the question of whether information is preserved or not is settled just from the fact that gravity in ADS is equivalent to a conformal field theory on the boundary, which is unitary. But as we explained uh, 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 yesterday, uh, another question is uh, what happens in the interior of the black hole, behind the horizon of this black hole. And in particular, we would like to understand whether uh, there is uh, anything uh, singular on the horizon uh, which, was, uh, which we discussed yesterday from the point of view of the CFT. So, um, so uh, 
as I already said, uh, we would like to understand uh, whether these black holes in ADS have a smooth horizon, and in particular, we will phrase the question for large black holes in ADS. So at first, you might think that uh, for large black holes in ADS, since those black holes do not evaporate, there is no paradox, there is nothing to, uh, to worry about. However, in the next few slides, I will, I will show that even for those black holes, large black holes, it is very difficult to uh, reconcile uh, the uh, smoothness of, the, of their horizon with unitarity in the dual conformal field theory. And because these black holes are very well understood from the point of view of the boundary, uh, this formulation of the paradox is the most precise from a mathematical point of view. Now, in order to address the question of the uh, space-time near the horizon of a black hole, uh, we need to understand how to describe local physics in ADS, because the question we want to study is what happens to an observer crossing the horizon of a black hole. So it is a local question. It, it has to be uh, phrased in terms of for example, correlation functions that the infalling observer would measure uh, when crossing the horizon. So the first step is to remind you how we can uh, reconstruct local observables in ADS from the point of view of the boundary. Now, we will be working with a conformal field theory uh, with a, which has a gravity dual, and uh, we will always work in the larger limit and also the strong coupling limit, so you can think of the n equals 4 at large, at large n and large lambda. And then there is a basic understanding of how to represent local fields in ADS, uh, approximately local fields in ADS, in terms of the uh, so-called uh, hamilton kabat lipschitz law construction, the SKLL construction, uh, which is the following idea. Suppose we have a, a field phi in ADS, let's say a scalar field in ADS, which is uh, dual to an operator uh, O, a single trace operator in the conformal field theory. Now, uh, this field phi in ADS, in the larger limit, uh, it will behave like a free field because all couplings in the theory are controlled by 1 over n. So uh, in the larger limit, this field will obey the Klein-Gordon equation in ADS with some mass which is related to the conformal dimension of the operator O. And uh, moreover, we have a boundary condition for the field uh, near the boundary of ADS, which is that as we approach the boundary of ADS, the bulk operator uh, should be identified with a boundary operator at uh, the same point x, provided that you multiply by some uh, overall factor of z. So you have some field of being a, uh, an equation in the interior of ADS, and uh, you have some boundary condition, and uh, this allows you to uh, solve this problem and express the field in the interior in terms of the boundary values of the field, which is the dual operator O. So uh, the most convenient way to, uh, to solve this problem is by uh, taking the, 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 the operator of the boundary, O, and uh, fully transforming it uh, on the sphere. So we expand this field in uh, spherical harmonics on the sphere and in Fourier modes in time, uh, thereby introducing these operators, O, omega, and M. Uh, so let me define them here. So these objects are defined as uh, the integral on the boundary of um, the boundary, the, the local single trace operator multiplied by some spherical harmonics. So these are the Fourier modes of the boundary single trace operator. And then the point is that if you take those modes <clears throat> and you multiply them by some wave functions, which are solutions of the Klein-Gordon equation in ADS, uh, you, 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 you can write down an operator in the CFT uh, which uh, can play the role of the local bulk field in the larger limit. So uh, as you can see, this object uh, depends on uh, the coordinates of the on t omega as well as the coordinate z, which is the radial direction in ADS. So naively, you, you might think that this is an operator in ADS, but the statement is that this is a CFT operator. You can see on the right-hand side that we have written down this object in terms of CFT operators times some wave functions. And the point is that uh, this object <clears throat> seems to depend on uh, uh, the coordinates of ADS, but it is a CFT operator. And in particular, you can verify that in the larger limit, uh, if you take uh, two points in ADS, P1 and P2, and if these two points are space-like with respect to the ADS metric, uh, this, uh, op these operators, these two operators will commute. So in some sense, this operator, this CFT operator, can reproduce the locality of, of the higher dimensional space-time, the, the causality structure of the higher dimensional space-time. 
uh, let me emphasize that this, uh, from the safety point of view, this is a non-local operator because we have taken the local operator O and we have smeared it on the boundary, both in space and in time. So it's a little bit of, it's a peculiar object where we have to act with the operator at uh, different times. But this allows us to reconstruct the point in ADS, uh, at a, a, a field in ADS at a particular point. Now, this construction is not exact. In particular, um, it is perturbative in the one over n expansion. Uh, uh, so if you look at this commutator, uh, and if you uh, consider the one over, one over n corrections to correlators on the boundary, you will find that this commutator is, becomes non-zero by factors of one over n. And then you have to go back and correct this definition by one over n corrections in order to restore locality in the bulk. So this entire construction is, is, is uh, perturbative in one over n. Um, so we, we don't know how to do it non-perturbatively, so we have to live with this construction for now. And also, I would like to emphasize that this construction is not entirely satisfactory because uh, in order to define this object, we have to use the solutions of the Klein-Gordon equation uh, in ADS, uh, which sort of assumes that we have <coughs> a bulk dual with a particular geometry. And in that sense, it sort of uses the bulk equations of motion in order to write down this object. So you know, one would hope that uh, a more fundamental uh, representation of these operators uh, will be found one day where we don't have to put in by hand the fact that the, the, geometry, the dual geometry is ADS. But uh, for now, and if we work, work, want to work in the larger limit, uh, this is a good starting point in order to explore uh, local observables in ADS. Another way of thinking about this object is that um, so by inserting these wave functions here and uh, replacing uh, this uh, fully transform in terms of the local operator, uh, you can uh, change the order of the integrals and you can represent uh, this local operator in ADS in terms of an, um, an integral over the boundary operator multiplied by some kernel, uh, which you can write down explicitly in the case of ADS. And roughly speaking, uh, you can see that as the point moves deeper into ADS, you can, uh, the support of this kernel of the boundary increases. So in this way, we can reproduce a local physics in empty ADS from the point of view of the boundary. And now we want to do the same thing in the presence of a black hole. Now, before I go on, uh, I would like to uh, say a few things about the types of black holes that we will be considering. So yesterday, there were a few questions about uh, the ensemble. Do we fix the temperature? Do we fix the, the, the mass? And so on and so forth. So let me make some comments about that. So one class of black holes that you can consider in ADS are black holes that you can form by gravitational collapse. For example, you, 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 you throw in some matter in the CFT at some time t equals zero, it collapses into a black hole. Uh, if, the, if the amount of matter is large enough, it will be a large black hole and it will equilibrate and it will stay there. Now, I want to say that uh, this type of black hole is not the most general state that you can uh, have at a particular energy in the CFT. And if you remember yesterday, we introduced the notion of a typical black hole microstate, which I will make a little bit more precise now. So we take uh, all um, energy eigenstates of the conformal field theory, uh, which lie within a particular window of energy. So uh, in the case of the n equals 4, uh, this E naught would be some uh, number, some energy of order n squared. So we take some energy, energy in the, the deconfined phase of the theory. And this energy window delta E, uh, we can take to be something which is, let's say, order one. Or we could, we could, even, we could even make it smaller, but that is sufficient for, the, for our purposes. So we take a very small window of energy. And there are many microstates, many uh, eigenstates uh, within that window. And then the typical black hole microstate will be uh, a linear combination of those states. Uh, with coefficients ci, which are randomly chosen. Now, the precise definition of random, randomness is uh, in terms of the harm measure, which I introduced yesterday. So remember, we think of the ci's as parameterizing points on a very large sphere. We define the uniform measure on the sphere, and this defines a notion of randomness for these ci's. So this guy here is what we, call, what we will be calling from now on a typical black hole microstate in the conformal field theory. So the important thing to remember is that the energy of the state is sharply fixed, sharply defined. Okay, so now an important point is that uh, these type of microstates uh, are, uh, uh, the, 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 the number of states that you can form by gravitational collapse is much smaller than 
the total number of, of typical microstates. Uh, this is a simple estimate you can do. You can uh, consider uh, all possible initial conditions, possibly initial microstates for a star of given mass m, which can collapse and form a black hole of mass m. And if you estimate that entropy, which we can do perhaps during the discussion later today, uh, you will see that that entropy is parametrically smaller than the bekenstein hawking entropy. So in particular, the entropy, if we work in ADS4, uh, the entropy of a star of mass m uh, scales like um, m to the 3 over 2, while the entropy of a black hole scales like the area, which goes like m squared. So you notice that uh, there are many more black hole microstates than the microstates that you can start with if you have a star undergoing collapse. So uh, because of this difference, it's important to keep in mind that there's a distinct distinction between black holes which are formed by gravitational collapse in ADS and typical black hole microstates. And there are many more microstates of this type than those you can form by gravitational collapse. Um, some of the statements. Kiriakos, maybe, can you repeat the question for everybody? Uh, uh, in this story, uh, in how many dimensions do we work? Do we work in ADS? Can we do any of this in ADS2 or ADS3? Well, uh, ADS2 and ADS3 are, have special properties. So, most, uh, I mean, the statements I'm going to make are certainly true in ADS4 and higher. Some of the statements may have to be refined for ADS3 and ADS2. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Say it again, please. No, uh, good. The question was, do we have a page curve for this black hole? A page curve. Well, these black holes do not evaporate. I mean, we have decided to look at large black holes in ADS. So these black holes do not evaporate. They are in a thermal equilibrium with their Hawking radiation, right? Uh, so the black hole is uh, sitting there, it emits Hawking radiation, but as you know, in ADS there is a gravitational potential which is pulling everything towards the center. So these Hawking particles will get reflected and they will fall back into the black hole and then the black hole reaches an equilibrium where it does not evaporate. So there, there is no pace curve. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, could you maybe repeat, repeat, uh, rephrase the question a bit? I did not understand. The question is, is this the uh, ADS analog of the picture I was drawing yesterday for flat space? So in flat space, I, I drew two different pictures. I drew uh, this one. Uh, this was a collapsing uh, star. I also drew the one uh, where we take evaporation into account. Right? Uh, so this black hole does not evaporate, so it is the equivalent of this one. So, uh, all right, so the rest of my talk will uh, uh, use this notion of a typical black hole microstate quite a lot, so I hope the definition from the CFT point of view is clear. Uh, and uh, I want to uh, emphasize an important property of these uh, uh, states. Uh, the important property is that, is that if you select this coefficient ci randomly, this stays to be uh, almost time independent. How do we see that? Well, uh, you calculate the uh, time derivative of some operator a on the state psi, the state psi, and you estimate the size of this time derivative, uh, provided that these ci's are selected randomly. Now. Uh, so let me, let me explain this estimate. So we have this operator A that we will uh, normalize so that, uh, uh, we will normalize A so that uh, the expectation value of A squared uh, on the state is of order one. So we take some operator whose two point function on the state uh, psi is of order one. Now, uh, if you, um, um, if you, uh, take this relationship and you estimate the size of the matrix element, of the octagonal matrix elements of this guy, 
you can show that these are exponentially small by a factor of e to the minus s over 2. Uh, the idea is that if you square this guy, you get e to the minus s. And then there are, are uh, e to the s states that contribute because there are that many uh, micro, uh, eigenstates. And then in order for this to be order 1, then the individual matrix elements must be of the order of e to the minus s over 2. I, I will explain this in more detail later if you want. So these matrix elements are of the order of e to the minus s over 2. And the coefficients ci uh, are uh, of the order of e to the minus s over 2 as well because we have um, e to the s coefficients in that sum and uh, sum of ci squared must be equal to 1 because the state must have unit norm. So this means that uh, each one of these guys must have magnitude of the order of e to the minus s over 2. And uh, since these guys have been chosen randomly and they're complex numbers, uh, the phase of this object will be randomly uh, distributed. So then we have this sum over ci, ci star, cj times aij, and we want to estimate the size of this sum. So, uh, so we get a factor of uh, e to the minus s over 2 from this coefficient, another factor of e to the uh, s over 2 from this guy, times e to the minus s over 2. But then we are summing over i and j, so you would naively think that we get a factor of e to the 2s. And then if you multiply all of these guys together, you get something which is of the order of e to the plus s over 2. However, you have to take into account that these numbers are complex numbers with random phases. So if you sum e to the 2s random phases, the typical size of that object is the square root of e to the 2s. So in that way, we, get, we lose one power of s, and the whole thing scales like e to the minus s over 2. So this shows that if you take a random superposition of energy eigenstates uh, in, the, in this quantum field theory, the states will appear to be time independent, up to exponentially small corrections. So in other words, what we uh, will be calling typical states can be identified what we would naturally call equ an equilibrium state in the conformal field theory, so, which we define by states where the time derivatives of observables are close to zero. Yeah. Her measure is what I defined yesterday. Uh, you, you, th you think of the CIs as parameterizing points on a sphere. This is an equation for a sphere. You define the uniform measure on the sphere. That is the higher measure. Yeah. OK. So now, uh, let's uh, start thinking. Of, so these this seem to be black holes, which are in equilibrium. So if you think about uh, the Penrose diagram in ADS, uh, the, it will have the following form. It will look like this. At least, uh, we will start talking about the exterior, and then we'll discuss what happens behind the horizon. So for now, do not pay attention on this part of the diagram. We're just going to study this one. So uh, these states seem to be in equilibrium, so we expect that the geometry here will be the ads Rorschach geometry. Then the question we'll address later is what happens behind the horizon. But this part is expected to be ads Rorschach. And we want to consider uh, local operators or fields in this region of space-time. And we want to reconstruct them from a boundary. So the starting point will be to analyze this problem in effective field theory in gravity. And then we will see how to reproduce the same result from the CFT. Now, if I give you a black hole in ADS, uh, which is uh, in equilibrium, so it is a static black hole in ADS, you can quantize the field on the background of a black hole. And uh, if you demand that the field is in equilibrium, you find uh, the following results. You take the field and you expand it in some modes B times some wave functions, which are modes in ADS. So this, this, uh, this uh, Fs are uh, the solutions of the klein gordon equation on, on the background of an ads Rorschach black hole. So you expand the field in a base of modes in the bulk, and then you introduce some operators B, <coughs> which will obey the usual algebra. And uh, as you can imagine, what you find if you do the calculation in effective theory, uh, so it's similar to the calculation of Hawking, is that uh, these modes are thermally populated with a temperature beta, which is determined by the mass of the black hole. So in the bulk, we have these modes B, which seem to be thermally populated. 
and they can be used to build up the field phi, uh, describing a local, a, a klein gordon field in the exterior of an ADS black hole. So now we want to see how we can reconstruct this from the CFT point of view. The equation was uh, the spread of energy delta E. How does it enter? The answer is it does not enter. Uh, so this statement here is about uh, effect field theory in the bulk. So in, in the next slide, I will talk about the boundary CFT where this spread of energy would enter. But uh, let me say that for this uh, calculation that we're doing, uh, it doesn't matter what the spread of the energy is. It can be quite small. And in fact, if, you, if the n equals 4 obeys the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, which I think uh, it is generally expected that it should, uh, then you can take the spread to be almost zero. So you can even take an energy eigenstate. Yeah. Yeah, so this is what is called the ADS hartle hawking vacuum. Uh, because uh, we, uh, we assume that the black hole is in equilibrium. Which follows from the previous statement Right? These typical states, they, they're uh, in time independent up to exponentially small corrections, so it is reasonable to assume that the, the field in the bulk is going to be in an equilibrium state, which is given by the ads hartle hogan state. Okay, now let's move on to the boundary. So we have this microstate psi, which has energy over the n squared, and then we need to use a property of single trace operators uh, on this state, which is that if you consider an endpoint function, small n, uh, of single trace operators on this typical uh, black hole microstate, then uh, this uh, correlation function factorizes into products of two point functions. Now, um, is the statement uh, obvious to everyone, or should I explain why that is the case? So, one way of motivating this expansion uh, is the following. First of all, we consider this object here. It's a, it is a correlation function on a, uh, on a typical state. So we have psi, O, 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 psi. And as a first step, we can um, use the results that we uh, presented yesterday. Uh, so I wrote down a theorem that any correlation function of this form is going to be very close to the microcanonical correlation function up to exponentially small corrections. This was a theorem I mentioned yesterday, where uh, rho m is a microcanonical density matrix centered around the energy of the state, psi. Then, you can also approximate the microcanonical ensemble with the canonical ensemble, so this is going to be equal to the trace of rho uh, of e to the minus beta h over z, times O, 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 plus one over S corrections. So this shows that the correlation function of single trace operators on a pure state are going to be equal to the correlation functions on a thermal state plus one over S corrections. Now, these guys, we can argue that they do factorize. For instance, you can think of it in terms of uh, double line diagrams. These thermal correlators you can formulate on, uh, the, uh, in Euclidean signature by compactifying the thermal circle, and then you can think about it perturbatively in double line diagrams. And then the, the usual Toft expansion holds, so you, we expect that these correlators factorize. And then by this uh, uh, like, uh, reasoning, we, we conclude that even the correlators on a typical pure state are going to factorize at large n into products of two-point functions. This is the usual large n factorization applied to a pure state, a pure heavy state. However, uh, the two-point function in which they factorize, so this, this object here, is not the two-point function of the operator in the ground state. Rather, it is the two-point function of the operator on the thermal state. So this, so we, this big guy, this correlator, factorizes into products of two-point functions, but each of these objects is actually very complicated, and it's not easy to compute it. It's a, it is a thermal two-point function. Uh, so, uh, however, even though we cannot really compute it, we can say a few things about it. For instance, we can uh, verify that it uh, obeys the so-called KMS condition. Um, 
which uh, is the statement that if you take the two-point function of this operator O at finite temperature and you uh, analytically continue the time argument uh, up to uh, minus high beta, then you get uh, back the same correlator with the order of the operators interchanged, which is the reason that we get this minus T and minus X. So proving this is very, is, is very simple, and we can uh, discuss it if you have questions, but it's a very standard property, which you can think of basically as periodicity in Euclidean time. So this is an exact statement. Uh, even though we cannot calculate this correlator, we know that this has to be true, and we will use it in what follows. So uh, as before, we define this, uh, this boundary uh, Fourier modes of the field. This is what I wrote down there. And the KMS condition can be translated into Fourier language, and then what it says is that if you calculate uh, uh, O dagger O, uh, then you get this factor to the minus beta omega times O of dagger. All these correlators are uh, correlators at finite temperature. So this is a statement about finite temperature correlators uh, in the N equals four. Now, remember, we had this expansion in the bulk. This was the field in the bulk, which was expanded in terms of this most B, which played the role of creation and inhalation operators of particles in, uh, around the black hole. And now we will try to identify these Bs with uh, uh, the boundary operators O, the Fourier modes of the field. Now, uh, when we do this identification, we also have to uh, take into account of the normalization of the operators, and in particular, uh, we will divide uh, this uh, boundary uh, Fourier mode O by the uh, square root of the expectation value of the commutator. And the reason we are doing that is in order to ensure that the commutation relations between B and B dagger are the canonical ones. The reason that we have to do it is if you define the Fourier mode of the boundary field in this way, then it is not true that uh, O of omega, O of omega dagger is equal to, uh, well, let's do it more precisely. It is not true that this is proportional to delta. There is some function here, G of omega, which is not trivial, and we cannot calculate it. We cannot calculate it because the theory is strongly coupled. Uh, but by dividing by this uh, factor, we get rid of that uh, that, uh, that factor, and we can define operators which, are, uh, which have canonical commutation relations and can be identified with the creation and inhalation operators uh, in the bulk. Yeah? Yes. Well, see, here we are working with the primaries which are, which are dual to, so the question was, does this equation hold for all primaries? Um, so here we want to uh, reconstruct the, the fields in the bulk that you can see at the level of supergravity. So we want to concentrate on primaries whose conformal dimension does not scale with N or with uh, lambda. So the conformal dimension of these guys is taken to be something of order one. Finally, uh, it is a simple algebra then to check that uh, if you define these operators B uh, by identifying them with the O then and using the KMS condition, you reproduce the expected thermal exp uh, occupation level for these guys. So remember somebody asked me yesterday whether we are working in the canonical or the microcanonical ensemble. Well, here we see that even though the state is self psi, the state psi is the state in the microcanonical ensemble, if you consider uh, the quantum fields in the exterior of the black hole, uh, they seem to be thermally populated with a temperature beta, where beta has to be related to the energy of the state in the microcanonical ensemble by the usual relationship between microcanonical and canonical, which allows you to translate a particular temperature to a particular energy. Uh, well, so now we identify this B with O, which allows us to express the local field in the exterior of the black hole. Sorry, I will repeat the question in just a second. So uh, we, 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 define this, uh, we identify this O with the Bs, and now we can write down an operator in the CFT by using these O's multiplied by the, some wave functions, and then you can check that this uh, field phi uh, the correlate, correlation function of this phi on the pure microstate reproduce the correlation functions that you would calculate in effective field theory uh, in the background of a black hole 
where you take the, the quantum state of the field to be the hartley hopkins state. The, right. So uh, did I answer your question? Yes, I'm the massing correlators. I, I'm trying to reproduce the correlators of the bulk by calculation of the boundary. Yeah. Uh, we, yeah, so the question is, uh, is this supposed to be an exact identification? So uh, this identification is supposed to be true only at large n at the level of operators. Uh, say it again, please. So the question is, uh, are we making an operator identification or simply that the fact that the correlators uh, agree? Uh, the answer is that, uh, as I said before, even, even in empty ADS, when we write down these equations, even without a black hole, even in empty ADS, unfortunately, we cannot do something stronger than masking the correlators. So it's not a full identification of operators because we do not know how to extend this, this construction to, uh, you know, to all orders, in, not even to all orders in all of our n, or even uh, what would be even harder to do it non-perturbatively in, in n. So uh, at this point, the, 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 this reconstruction of the bulk is perturbative in one over n. So I can identify the operators only at a particular order in one over n. But that is okay because the paradox can be perfectly formulated even working uh, uh, with a leading order in, uh, at large n. So even at to leading order at large n, there is a paradox that has to be resolved. So the question you're asking is uh, something even more uh, difficult, right? It would be to find the exact operator identification uh, between the boundary and the bulk, which is not something we are able to do right now. So, uh, so in this way, we can define the CFT operator, uh, which seems to reproduce the correlation functions of the bulk operator uh, around in the exterior of an ADS black hole, uh, evaluated on a typical uh, black hole microstate. OK, now, uh, so everything is fine in the exterior. Uh, I just want to make a, one small comment that uh, if you follow this reasoning, uh, you can derive some bounds about the variance of this object uh, among different pure states following uh, arguments similar to those that I, uh, that I explained yesterday. And this imposes very strong uh, restrictions about the possibility that the geometry outside the horizon is modified on, you know, on, on pure microstates. So sometimes uh, there are proposals that the geometry of a, of a given microstate, of different black hole microstates, may, uh, may differ depending on the microstate, but uh, this construction imposes some restrictions because uh, if different microstates have different geometry, then these correlators will have to have a very large variance uh, among different pure states, which is excluded by some of the arguments that I presented yesterday. Okay, so this was everything I want to say about the, the exterior of the black hole, and then the question is, uh, how can we move, uh, how, what happens if we try to move behind the horizon? So I think the question, let me repeat the question. The question was that this microstate psi that we're talking about is a superposition of many different energy eigenstates. So the question was whether uh, each of the elements of the superposition could be very different from the average. Was that uh, the question? Uh, yes, that's a possibility. That would contradict what is called the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, which postulates that uh, energy eigenstates look very similar to, uh, to each other, basically, and to the thermal state. And uh, as I mentioned yesterday, um, your question is related to something I mentioned yesterday, which is that uh, we, I, I argued yesterday that uh, 
typical states look identical. That's what I argued, right? However, uh, it is possible to find a basis of a typical state. So you can find the full basis of the Hilbert space of states where each of the elements of the basis is atypical. That is possible. I can give you an example in terms of a spin chain if you want. It's very simple to see that. Uh, so what I wanted to say here is not that the, you cannot find some atypical states whose geometry will be different. There could even be a basis of, of states. What I wanted to say is that if you take a, a random superposition of those states, uh, the geometry will always look like the ADS shortest geometry. Take care, please. I'm sorry, I cannot hear you. Can you speak a bit louder? Yes, it can be completely orthonormal. Uh, let, let, okay, let me give you an example. Uh, take a spin chain. So you take n spins, right? So the spins can be up or down, right? So uh, we have n spins. And we, we want to write down a typical state of this spin chain. The typical state of the spin chain will be a superposition of uh, these states where we have definite spin. Let's call them i. So i is a state where each of the spins is either up or down. So these i's are eigenstates of the spins. And a general state is a superposition of all of those, where this i goes from 1 up to 2, two to the n. Right? So this is the typical state. If you calculate the expectation value of a spin uh, of this state, uh, you will find that uh, it's zero, right? And it's exponentially close to zero based on the theorem that I, was, that I mentioned earlier. You can really show that if you, if you just randomly select the CIs and you compute the expectation value of the first spin, it's going to be exponentially small. However, these guys, they are an orthonormal basis. In each one of those, the spin is either plus one or minus, uh, plus half or minus half. So it's very far from the average in each of those states. So this is the basis of atypical states for this particular example. Okay. Yeah. The question is, do I use regularity at the horizon? Yeah, so this F beta WM, they are constructed in some ADS Schwarzschild black hole geometry. Correct. Using some regularity at the horizon or? Uh, yeah, so th this, these were the, uh, the most that you would get uh, assuming the naive uh, ADS Schwarzschild geometry where uh, you quantize the field in the exterior and you get a continuous spectrum, right? In particular, you do not impose any boundary conditions on the horizon. You just impose normalizable boundary conditions at infinity, and you get a continuous set of modes, uh, which uh, I'm using here. So, uh, so no, no, no regularity condition at the horizon. Or no, uh, well, this is the usual calculation. Um, uh, Near the horizon, the field is a linear combination of in-going and outgoing modes. I don't know if that answers your question. So the, 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 the mo well, each of these modes, if you take a particular frequency, it's highly oscillating near the horizon. But uh, that, is, that always happens. Even in regular space, if you expand in base of regular modes, you get these highly oscillating uh, modes, uh, which you can then superimpose to form smooth wave packets that can just go through the horizon without any, any singularity. So here I am assuming, what I am assuming here is that the classical background is the ADS Schwarzschild geometry. And these F betas are more like the Rindler modes. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the question is, is it possible to go beyond semi-classical picture? Uh, if you are talking about uh, I including one over n corrections, uh, it is possible, but it's a little bit difficult because um, when you start going uh, to sublinear order in one over n, uh, there are two different effects that interfere. One effect is that you have to take into account interactions in the bulk, uh, but at the same time, this difference between the microcanonical and the canonical ensemble gives you corrections of the order of one over n, powers of one over n, 
which will mix with the other types of corrections. So there are two sources of corrections. And uh, um, in general, it's difficult to disentangle the two and to control, uh, in particular, uh, it's not very clear how to control these corrections in a strongly coupled theory. But the, 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 cor the one over n corrections when you convert from the canonical into the microcanonical. But as I already said, uh, that is okay for us because uh, the problem already is already visible to leading order at large n. So before we even go to the subleading orders, we have to resolve the problem. Okay, so now uh, we want to uh, move behind the horizon. And uh, as we discussed uh, yesterday uh, in the context of Rindler space, uh, if you want to be able to cross the horizon smoothly, <laughs> you need to have uh, modes on the two sides of the horizon uh, which must satisfy particular properties. So these guys, uh, which were the, the Rindler-like modes that uh, we were discussing uh, uh, before, uh, have to obey the computation relations that I already uh, wrote. And then we need a new set of modes, B tilde, uh, which must obey similar commutation relations, and they have to commute with the Bs, because they're space-like separated. So B tilde and B are uh, independent modes, so their commutator should be zero. And uh, so in particular, if we want to have a smooth horizon, we need to impose, we need to identify some operators B tilde in the conformal field theory, which will obey uh, commutation relations of this type. Uh, please notice when I write one, uh, well, to be more precise, this should have been a delta function of omega minus omega prime, and you can also write down the, ang the angular momentum indices, uh, m, but uh, they don't play any important role, so I, I will skip them from now on. I will just write down the frequency, omega. Now, these are some of the conditions that we need. Uh, uh, in addition to those, we need the condition that both the b's and the b tilde's have to be thermally populated in order for the horizon to be smooth. Now, uh, if you want to understand how to derive these relations, uh, the best thing you, you, you can do is to uh, go back to Rindler space and work out this, uh, the similar uh, structure there. And uh, you will see that uh, in the Minkowski vacuum, uh, these conditions are satisfied, of course, and these are also satisfied where for Rindler space, beta would be equal to 2 pi. So the temperature is, has a particular value. And you can also verify in uh, the toy model of Rindler space that if you modify any of these conditions, you start to see excitations on the horizon. That's what I mentioned yesterday, that if you modify, uh, um, sorry, I, I'm sorry, I forgot one more, one more equation. We also want that uh, B omega, B omega tilde to be e to the minus beta omega over two, B omega, B omega dagger. So we also need the, the, the modes to be entangled in a very specific way. And uh, if you violate any of these conditions, you will generate a stress tensor on the horizon, which will indicate that the horizon is no longer uh, smooth. So the question now is, can we identify CFT operators which uh, satisfy these conditions? Yeah. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, right. We will discuss this point a little bit later. So the question is, uh, in, in Riddler space, uh, we um, drew the diagram yesterday. Uh, we, had, uh, we had the Bs defined on this side and the B tildes on this side. And we, then we said that these B tildes will propagate uh, in the future like that. So an infolding observer will detect the B tildes coming from the left side and the Bs coming from the right side. And they have to be entangled in a specific way for the horizon to be smooth. So the question was, uh, can we think of this bit tilde as coming from the analog of the left side? That's a very good question. We will come back to this in, uh, maybe in the next lecture. So I will talk about this. Yes. Can you say it again, please? What do you mean by similar equation? Yeah, yeah, so uh, the question is, do we assume that this bit tilde will have uh, similar uh, equations as the ones that I was writing in the previous slides? We're trying to get there. Uh, for now, what I'm writing down uh, is the minimal set of conditions that we need in order for the horizon to be smooth. So I'm not making any statement at this moment. 
about how this bit tilde is realized in the CFT. I'm not saying that this bit tilde is related to some single trace operator. I'm just saying that if we want the horizon to be smooth, there must be an operator bit tilde which has these properties. And we'll try to identify this operator in, in the next uh, slide. Okay, so uh, now let me make a comment about this, um, uh, where these operators B tilde are coming from, which is actually related to your question. Um, so uh, now if you consider a black hole formed by gravitational collapse in ADS, these B tildes are nothing else but the guys that you can, as we discussed yesterday, you can trace them back through the collapsing star and see where they came from on the CFT. So they will get reflected at R equals zero, and then uh, these modes will go back and hit the boundary. So if you have a black hole formed by, from, formed by gravitational collapse, then uh, you could try to identify these B-tilde operators by tracing them back and uh, identifying them by some operators in the CFT at a point which is actually before the moment where you, uh, the collapsing shell was injected into the CFT. However, this type of, uh, uh, this strategy to identify the B-tildes has some problems. The first problem is the, the so-called Transplankian problem, which I already discussed yesterday. And the, the problem is that if you want to find these B-tildes at the very late times, and if you trace them back, uh, you find that they get blue shifted, so then they collide with a star at very high energies, and then it's not clear anymore whether the one over n expansion will be reliable. Uh, but apart from this problem, uh, the other issue is that, uh, as I explained before, uh, the number of states that you can generate by gravitational collapse is a small subset of the number of states which is counted by the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. So these are not typical states. The states you can form by gravitational collapse are not typical black hole microstates. So if we, if we want to identify the B tildes for a typical black hole microstate, uh, we cannot do it by studying uh, black holes which are formed by gravitational collapse. Okay. So let us proceed now and explain uh, what is, uh, explain uh, that, uh, uh, why it is uh, difficult to identify these operators. <laughs> Sorry? It does not, it, it, the question was, is the collapsing matter null matter? It does not have to be null, it could be time-like. Okay. So let me now try to explain uh, what is the problem. Now, I'll give you a more general argument against the existence of these operators, which will make clear why there is a paradox. So uh, before we wrote down the algebra of the, of the Bs and the B tildes, but what I did not write down in the previous slides was the commutator of uh, these guys B and B tilde with a Hamiltonian. And now I will, uh, we will uh, introduce that commutator. For the modes which are outside the horizon, uh, just by using effective field theory, you can verify that the commutator of the Hamiltonian with a creation operator B dagger is equal to omega times B dagger. That makes sense. This object is a creation operator. It adds one particle outside the horizon and the energy of the CFT increases. That is intuitive, that, that makes sense. On the other hand, if you look at the, the commutator between the CFT Hamiltonian and the B tilde dagger, uh, you find that there's a minus sign relative to that one. So this means that these B tilde dagger operators uh, have the property that uh, when you act with a creation operator of B tilde dagger, you're actually lowering the energy of the CFT. So you, if you add a particle here, you are lowering the energy. If you add two particles, you are low, lowering the energy even more, and so on and so forth. So as you can imagine, that is a uh, sort of uh, unstable situation because then you would imagine that the system would thermally produce uh, pairs of particles, B and B tilde, uh, without, there's no energy cost in the production of these of this pairs, but, but you would get some entropy. So uh, it sounds like an unstable situation, that, that the fact that we can add particles and lower the energy. And as I will explain, there's a, a precise mathematical contradiction in this algebra that I will, uh, I, will, uh, I will explain. But just to give you some intuition why we get this minus sign, uh, you can think of the Hamiltonian as being the generator of the killing isometry of the solution. So the killing isometry is time-like in the exterior. So it's, it's time translation in, in the exterior but in the interior it becomes space-like. So uh, 
the killing vector field in the interior of the black hole is space-like, which means that these eigenvalues of the operators with respect to the vector field uh, play the role of momentum, so they can be positive or negative from the point of view of effect field theory. And that is the reason that you can find some modes in the interior which have effectively uh, negative momentum with respect to the scaling vector field, but when you translate it back on the CFT, it becomes negative energy. Okay, so now let me uh, explain why this algebra is inconsistent. So, uh, we will try to calculate the number operator, the, the expectation value of the number operator for modes uh, behind the horizon. Using this algebra. And we will take the trace uh, because we want to calculate the average of this quantity over all possible uh, microstates. Now, let me call this object a uh, small n. It's the expectation value of this number operator. Now, using this algebra, uh, if I use the condition, uh, the commutator A B tilde dagger is equal to minus omega the dagger. From this one, we, we, can, we get that E to the minus beta H B tilde dagger is equal to E to the beta omega times uh, B tilde dagger E to the minus beta H. Okay, so now uh, I will apply this uh, uh, relation inside the trace. So we will uh, change the order of these two guys, which will give us e to the beta omega times trace e tilde dagger e to the minus beta h beta tilde. Now we can use the cyclicity of the trace to rewrite this as it's a beta omega trace to the minus beta h b tilde dagger, b tilde, b tilde dagger. And now I can use the other commutation relation, this one, to rewrite it as e to the beta omega times trace e to the minus beta h b tilde dagger b tilde plus one. Okay, but this quantity here is precisely what we call n in the beginning, right? That's the thing we want to calculate. So, uh, looking at this equation, what we found was that n is equal to e to the beta omega n plus one. Now we can solve for n. <laughs> And we find that n is equal to minus e to the beta omega divided by e to the beta omega minus 1, which is negative. So we started with a, a, an operator which was positive definite because it, it is of the, it's, it's, sorry, it's non negative, it is of the form b dagger b, b tilde dagger b tilde. So this is a non-negative operator, and we're trying to calculate the trace of this operator multiplied by density matrix which has positive eigenvalues, and we get something negative. So this is inconsistent, right? So th this shows that uh, postulating this algebra, I mean, this algebra that we wrote down, b tilde, b tilde dagger is equal to one, h b tilde dagger is minus omega b tilde dagger, has some sort of inconsistency if you try to evaluate the, uh, the expectation value of this trace. Yeah, it's time to stop. Uh, yeah, so uh, just two minutes, right? So, uh, so we, we get this inconsistency, which means that that algebra uh, has some, some, some issue. So are there any questions about this? Yeah. This Hamiltonian is the CFT Hamilton. Yeah, um, well, okay. 
the question is, is there another problem here? Uh, well, because the Hamiltonian seems to be unbounded from below. Yeah, so somebody could say that uh, that is not maybe a very big problem because uh, these equations are supposed to hold only at the level of effect field theory, which means that you're allowed to uh, lower the energy only uh, a certain number of times, which does not scale with capital N. And remember that the, the black hole that we started with had energy of order n squared. So we start with a black hole of energy of order n squared. So in order to get to zero, to zero energy, we would have to lower this energy of the order of n squared times, which would not be allowed at the level of effect field theory. But this problem here is present even, let's say, uh, for, uh, let's say, low point function of this B, B tilde dagger. So even if you act a small number of times, you run into a contradiction uh, with this, uh, with this, uh, because of this argument. Now, uh, you could ask me a question, which is, uh, you, you claim that you derive these equations using effect field theory, and now you claim that there is a contradiction uh, that you get this negative trace, which is mathematically inconsistent. So this algebra must somehow be problematic. And if everything we have done so far is effect field theory, you could ask why hasn't this problem been noticed many decades ago? Because this problem was actually pointed out by, uh, by these authors uh, very recently, I mean, a few years ago. So you could ask why wasn't this noticed, let's say, in Birel and Davis, right, when they analyzed uh, the quantum fields on the background of a black hole. The point is that this, this inconsistency uh, we show this inconsistency by using the trace, which means we try to demand that this algebra is true on a very large number of states, which allowed us to replace the typical state by a trace. In Birel and Davis, uh, there, there would have been only one state, psi, of the, of the exterior, the, for example, the hartz hoffman state. And then one of the steps that they used, which was a cyclist of the trace, would not, would not have gone through, and you would not have been able to derive an inconsistency. So to summarize, this algebra in, is inconsistent if you demand that the algebra is true on a very large number of states. If you only have one state or a small number of states, there is no intrinsic inconsistency with the algebra. Okay, so to close, uh, the fact that we have this inconsistency suggests that uh, it is impossible to find operators B tilde and the CFT which uh, have the desired algebra for you know, typical states and hence, typical states will not have a smooth interior because you cannot find these operators in the CFT or perhaps the CFT is, no, is not able to describe a black hole interior. So in the next hour today, we will explain uh, some ways of uh, trying to um, uh, avoid this, uh, this problem and uh, identify these operators with tilde. I will explain how this, uh, what's the loophole in this, uh, in this uh, argument. Thanks.